Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Groom. I'm Aspet Bedrosian. And I'm Hovik Manucharyan. And this episode is being recorded on October 27, 2023. So in this conversations on Grung episode, we'll delve into Armenia, its foreign policy, Artsakh, geopolitical winds and global conflicts with a leader of one of the political parties, forces, the Armenian National Congress of Armenia, the political party associated with the first president, Levon Derbedrosian. So for this, we are joined by Levon Zurabian, who is the vice president of the Armenian National Congress Party of Armenia, which was the ruling party during the terms in office of Levon Der Bedrosian from 1991 to 1998. He worked in the presidential administration as aide and chief spokesman to the president. Mr. Zurabian makes appearances as a technical advocate for the ANC. Hello and welcome, Mr. Zurabian. We're very happy to talk with you. Hello, Aspen. Very nice to see you once again. And hello, Hovik. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Levon, you have been on the Armenian political scene for a long time. Since this is your first time on our show, please tell us about yourself, your profession, your interests, anything you would like to share with our audience. Okay, if you are interested in my in knowing my background, uh, I was a theoretical physicist by training. In 1991, I was invited to assist uh, the president of Armenia and have worked in that capacity until 1998, as you mentioned. Uh, since 1994, I was also tasked with uh, representing Ter Petrosan as his uh, chief spokesman. And after his resignation in uh, 1998, I went to New York and uh, started uh, studying in uh, a School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. In 2008, I was uh, the coordinator of a uh, massive popular movement, of which actually was uh, later institutionalized as Armenian National Congress uh, through a merger with uh, Armenian National Movement. Actually, the, the, the party that, as you mentioned, was uh, ruling Armenia since 1991 uh, until 1998, when Ter Petrosan resigned. Uh, on my hobbies or side interests, uh, I'm in love with technologies as a math mathematician and as a physicist. And sometimes I also act as a tech evangelist for ANC. Mm. And, um, Interests uh, range from uh, the sports to arts, from literature to science. They are very broad. Uh, I think this uh, will be enough for starting this conversation. Okay. So what does the ANC stand for today? What are its philosophies, ideologies, and its goals? Well, uh, we, uh, as, as a party, we actually... Uh, uh, promote liberal ideals, where we stand for liberalism, and we actually fought against uh, the Soviet communist regime, and we led Armenia to independence and to multi, a multi-party democracy. We uh, actually built Armenian, we made this restructuring from st rigid Stalinist administrative economy to the uh, market ruled and market based economy. So we stand for liberalism, we stand for freedom, uh, and uh, but a kind of social liberalism, which means that we uh, consider that uh, the state can sometimes intervene, but only with the uh, with the objective to ensure uh, just competition and ensure antitrust policies. Hmm. Uh, on the security, which is actually the most important issue for Armenia, and on foreign policies, uh, we, we, we stand for realism. Uh, if uh, I would uh, use one word to describe what uh, our party actually stands for, is, uh, uh, is realism versus uh, wishful thinking. Okay. Uh, uh, unfortunately, 
uh, our political forces are sick with this, uh, how to say, uh, wishful thinking, which means that we, uh, they, many of them put ambitions, uh, state ambitions or national ambitions, uh, above uh, real possibilities. And uh, what what we stand for is we are, we are trying to strike a perfect balance between the uh, national ambitions and legitimate ambitions and aspirations and uh, real possibilities for achieving those aspirations. And, uh, as a... in, and in the case of Nagorno-Karabakh, for example, we stand, uh, we stood for uh, rifle of uh, rifle self determination, and we fought for the uh, uh, for liberation for the liberation of uh, Nagorno Karabakh from Azerbaijani yoke, and we achieved the proposed goals. And when uh, the time came to actually. Uh, amplify uh, or strengthen our victory through diplomatic solution, which would uh, mean also uh, returning five territories uh, beyond Karabakh to Azeri, uh, kind of uh, Sinai deal as Israel did in back in 1978. Uh, we uh, were not able to do that because there was very powerful national extremist resistance to uh, what was our policy. And, you know, in 1998, right. the and uh, the, the project was not fulfilled. And we believe that, you know, put uh, delving in this kind of uh, wishful thinking and uh, ignoring realistic possibilities is what actually brought our country to the disaster we are living through right now. Levon, uh, you are on our podcast the first time, but I hope that we can have you back to actually uh, interrogate our history. All of these years of, um, you know, uh, you know, what you mentioned, what you just mentioned, I think it requires a much deeper analysis than we have time today. So in the interest of time, uh, I wanted to jump to the next question, which is, uh, about Nikol Pashinyan, who was allied with the uh, uh, Armenian National Movement uh, uh, circles uh, at the time. Uh, and then as a beginning politician, he was a member of the ANC Alliance in parliament. Uh, despite mm -hmm. parting ways with your political force and forming the Yelk Alliance, Pashinyan always had a reputation um, as a disciple of Levante Petrosen. I don't know how much that is correct or not, but that was at least the public uh, reputation. Um, and, you know, basically the Petrosian was seen as Pashinyan's ideological mentor. What did, uh, so when 2018 happened, um, what was the ANC response? Did the ANC endorse Pashinyan? Uh, and if so, what were the expectations? And what were they met? Well, let me counter by saying this. If you are the first president of the country, you are kind of destined to have thousands of disciples. People, though, differ in their capabilities and talents. There are good disciples and bad disciples who never learn what you teach to them. If Nicole is a disciple of Levanter Petrosian, he was a bad disciple. He entered uh, the parliament within uh, as a part of our team, ANC, and then cut all relations with us and uh, quickly developed from a Terpetrosianite realist into a not an inch of concession type extremist. He refused to negotiate with uh, Azerbaijan on the five plus two proposal by the Minsk group of OSC and uh, gave Azerbaijan a, a casus belli by proclaiming Artsakh is Armenia and that's it. And he went to war. We would never be able to win. And uh, let me conclude on that. Uh, Petrosian never taught Nicole to adopt that criminally adventurous 
policy, quite an opposite, very bad disciple. And yeah, sorry, we never in the Pashinya, never. Uh, neither in 2018 nor in uh, any other circumstance. Okay. Uh, we knew from the beginning who was coming to power, actually. But there were some, um, I guess, consultations with the Deputation, right, at that time? Yes, but let me tell you one thing. When uh, on 23rd uh, May, no, April of 2018, when Ser Sarkisian actually resigned from the office, uh, our team, a group of us, went to uh, Levanter Petrosian's house and told him that the whole nation is enthusiastically, happily celebrating the demise of Ser Sarkisian's regime. But uh, let me tell you that he was looking very murky at that moment. And he said, sadly, well, you should know, I am now the most unhappy person in this nation because I want you to know that the guy who comes now to power will destroy both Karabakh and Armenia. End of uh, quotation, actually. Uh, and I really hope that he was wrong on the Armenia part. No, what we did uh, was that we said we support democratic renovation of Armenia, any reforms in this direction, including transitional justice, fight against corruption, etc. And we did not participate in 2018 elections because it was obvious we stand no chance against Pashinyan in that atmosphere of revolutionary euphoria. What we did was the publication of uh, our platform for the democratic reformation of Armenia. They didn't implement anything from what we proposed. So, yeah, we we never endorsed Pashinyan. And from the beginning, we were anticipating uh, uh, anticipating very bad developments. Um, Levon, since the government system changed to a parliamentary style, Armenian citizens no longer elect many of their representatives, from mayors to prime ministers and so on. And since 2019, the country has been a single party supermajority ruled country. While mm -hmm. this supermajority remains in power, there is no way for the opposition to get anything done because they don't have the votes. And there's no way for them to stop anything from the government to uh, from doing it. Opposition groups currently say that there are over three dozen political prisoners in Armenia today. And after the 2021 elections, many non-ruling party election winners were harassed, slapped mm -hmm. with uh, alleged corruption lawsuits, jailed, forced into power sharing uh, compromises and so on. Yet Pashinyan continues to use the term democracy as a symbol of his rule. In fact, in his recent 44 minute speech in Strasbourg, he mentioned the term democracy 22 times. In your view, is Armenia a democratic state today? Well, uh, let me illustrate what you said just now mm -hmm. on the basis of a very important example that I know well personally. Uh, you know, uh, there is Alaverdi. Alaverdi is a city in Armenia. And uh, now it is a community uniting 24 towns, including such towns as Ahtala and Bozum, big towns, big villages in Armenia. So uh, the elections were held last year in, in, in Ahtala. And uh, the ruling civil contract party had, uh, after the elections, 13 delegates. Uh, country to Leave party, 13 delegates. So they were equal. Mm -hmm. And the remaining delegate was uh, ours, ANC's delegate, one. So by this one vote uh, in the council, uh, we were actually destined to become a kingmaker. So it, it, it was dependent on us who will actually run this whole community. And we made a coalition with the country to leave party because it was... Uh, uh, you know, inimaginable for us to 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 actually uh, cooperate with uh, the with the Nikol Pashinyan's party. That uh, country to live is associated with Ruben Vakmanian, uh, right? Aprilu Yergir. 
Yes. And then what happened was that uh, there, uh, there started threats, attempts to bribe our delegates, other people, uh, so that uh, uh, so, so that our coalition is not able to elect, uh, despite having majority, not able to elect a mayor. But we never succumbed to all these pressures. Uh, and uh, the coalition was formed, uh, but uh, on the day of voting of the mayor into his position, the police made efforts to hijack two members of the country to leave uh, faction under pretext of recruiting them for their army duties, for actually military service. They were literally smuggled through police cordons to, to, to be able to fulfill their constitutional duties uh, for the election of the mayor of the district. Can you imagine? I mean, uh, it was, I fully confirmed the, this, uh, you know, allegations of uh, harassment uh, against the political opponents. They, they do the, the worst thing you can imagine, uh, not to, allow, to not allow uh, any opponent to come to power. Uh, and now, after every attempt failed to prevent the election of the mayor, we have now uh, the mayor that was elected by our coalition, they opened a criminal case against the new mayor on completely falsified grounds. And uh, uh, th this also could not work. So what they did, they actually were able, they managed to, to bribe one of the delegates of uh, the country to leave party and are now in the process of engineering a vote of non-confidence to remove the democratically elected mayor in uh, effectively a coup against him. Mm -hmm. So yes, I confirm. Uh, this is, uh, we, we witnessed that in the case where we were involved and we know uh, allegations from other parties that they do that massively over all over the country. So basically, yes, this is not a democrat. Armenia is not a democratic country. It is a more or less free country, I would say, in terms of freedom of speech. Uh, that, that, that I would confirm. Although uh, sometimes you can see that people are uh, being put in jail uh, when uh, and you can actually uh, even uh, have some su suspicions that they were put in jail because of their active political position. Their politics, for, yeah. For, uh, for instance, uh, Armen Ashotia, the guy who uh, is a very uh, active member of the Republican Party, and I know a lot of people in the Republican Party who can who can be uh, you know really taken to jail or who can be uh, against whom a, a criminal uh, cases could be uh, initiated uh, on very legitimate grounds, but they never did that. They picked up the one in from this party who was the most politically active, who, most, who was the most uh, active op opponent, vocal opponent of uh, Pashinyan. So yeah, I can I can say that uh, these guys are not democratically minded, and uh, uh, it, uh, despite the fact that uh, right now we uh, exercise our right for, for freedom for free speech, yeah, we can quickly degenerate in a country where the the the, the freedom of speech would be so uh, actually. Let me ask, how is it that Pashinyan has failed at almost everything uh, during this term, including catastrophic war losses that we, we mentioned, yet remained the head of this government? How, how would one assess this term in office since 2018? That sounds as a paradox, actually. But um, I would mention two things. One, people, the people... Armenian people just not what they do not want the return of uh, plunderers. Uh, they they uh, consider them plunderers. Uh, they 
started to associate calls for patriotic resistance and support for Karabakh with ambitions of Kocharian and Sarkisian to return to power. So uh, this is one reason. People really resist to possibility of their return to power. The second thing is that uh, Pashinyan always, always reinvents his mission, so-called, so that uh, to be able to manipulate his disenchanted electorate into the one against again supporting him. The initial mission, as we remember, was the expropriation of expropriators and uh, return of plundered riches to ordinary people. He never delivered on that. He lost the war uh, eventually, and the new mission, a new mission was established, established called an era of peace with Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. And then this has uh, failed too, drastically failed. It's an Orwellian now, term anyway. Yeah. Now, the new mission is to get rid of evil Russia, which is now considered uh, by the ruling party and by Nikol Pashinyan as uh, the primary cause for two of his uh, above-mentioned initial failures. These things always end up with uh, finally blaming their own nation for all failures, I can tell you. That's the direction we are heading to. So Tay Petrosan's argument for not getting involved in the calls for regime change uh, after 2020 seemed to be that our faith is settled. Uh, we should work with Nicole to force him to do the right thing. At least that's what I understood from his from the latest attempt when they tried to do that in 2022. Uh, if you remember, the Catholicos tried to mediate between the former presidents. Um, is that a correct interpretation of LTP's or Levante Petrosan's position? Well, uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think, actually not, not that I think, I'm pretty sure because, uh, pretty confident because I uh, spoke with Petrosan uh, uh, several times on this matter, uh, that uh, what uh, he was trying was to actually uh, an attempt to unite the political elite of the country. Because, you know, um, uh, I don't know whether you have read the book by, uh, uh, what, what is his name? Uh, Jared Diamond, Jared Diamond's uh, The Guns, Gems, and Steel. But that one is a very good book, I, actually. Uh, it's a re really revealing uh, piece of uh, piece of uh, literature. But uh, I'm now referring to another one, uh, which is called Upheaval, and uh, it actually is a study. Uh, it's a, a Combina combination of study cases on how different countries like Japan, Finland, or Germany were uh, uh, handling the, their crisis. And uh, one of the most important conclusions that uh, the author comes to is that, you know, for any nation to come out of the crisis it actually uh, has been turned in is uh, uh, reaching consensus among the political elite of the country on on the very existence of that crisis. I mean, if if you are in denialist kind of position, if the, the political forces of the country of the uh, of if the political elite denies the very existence of the crisis, there is no chance you can get out of it. So. Uh, so Ter Petrosan was actually uh, trying to unite the nation uh, in this consensus about the existence of the crisis. So that, and and he and he was uh, addressing uh, the most uh, resourceful forces in the in the country, which were the ruling party of Nikol Pashinyan's 
Pashinyan. Uh, two other, uh, the two other uh, political groups that are represented as opposition in the parliament. And uh, also himself as the first president of the country. Uh, and uh, yeah, why not uh, religious leaders of our country? So that uh, there is a symbolical kind of uh, reunion or consensus on the existence of the uh, crisis, and we were, and we were, and we still are in a very, uh, very big trouble. So, what do you think was the cause? Of the, if if Levon Peterson was trying to unite the elite, um, you know, if I, if I remember, he went on national uh, television to present his points. Uh, about, I guess, topics around which to to unite, and wasn't uh, wasn't that entire uh, essentially narrative that you know yes we must help Pashinyan uh, as as bad as he is we must help Pashinyan succeed and we can't go through uh, regime change we cannot follow regime change so do you think that his uh, absolutist position on regime change um, was something that people could unite about. Well, uh, let's uh, put this this a little bit other way. Uh, you know, whoever is at power in Armenia in in these uh, tragic circumstances should uh, take very difficult decisions. The decisions that would not be liked by many. And uh, the nations sometimes are in the position like this when they have to uh, actually accept very difficult decisions. Now, uh, what he was saying was that let us seek for this solution together so that uh, we study and learn, we know the whole information, the uh, the new, the very nuanced information about the diplomatic uh, state of affairs, about the, our military resources, our financial resources, etc., and then find out uh, what would be the uh, how say uh, actually to choose between between evil solutions. I mean to 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 find out to find out the 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 best of them. Yeah, two bad okay. solutions. Yeah, between two or three or four bad solutions, we mm -hmm. have to pick up the one, and then after reaching consensus, we all stand for it because nobody can do that alone. Nobody can do that alone and uh, get the nation through these uh, difficult times. So that was his idea, to unite mm -hmm. everybody in seeking solution and standing for it. Because uh, I, I'm saying we were in a very difficult position. We, we uh, you know, uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan are eyeing the, you know, acquisition of territories from Armenia. They, they, they had this victory. They, they want more. They want to, they, they understand now how unprotected Armenia is and how Val has become. And uh, they want to capitalize on that. They, they want for uh, successes and uh, so the of the Armenian uh, political elite would be a very important answer to those designs and to those ambitions and appetites and uh, that was another uh, objective of uh, what uh, Ter Petrosan has proposed we, you know, We're running low on time but you're saying that Levon Ter Petrosan insisted that we unite, uh, but at the same time, he insisted also on abstaining from regime change. So let's, you know, for whatever it's worth, let's uh, get over that. But in hindsight, you know, do you think that it was still the right move? And do you think that today, you know, uh, allowing uh, Nikol Pashinyan to um, continue ruling Armenia as the way he is doing is uh, the right thing to do? Uh, actually, uh, I'm one of the, how to say, uh, most vocal blamers of uh, Nikol Pashinyan. I, I would always accuse him for his uh, fa disastrously faithful 
uh, decisions for Armenia, and uh, they, uh, I mean, there is, uh, and and he's a walking disaster actually for Armenia. He is not a strategist. He never calculates. He he his uh, uh, grip to power is based on what I call lycocracy, uh, because. Uh, what he he never strategizes. What he does is optimizing uh, he the number of likes in the Facebook. That's that that is his strategy, if you can call that a strategy. So he never takes uh, difficult decisions. He he actually uh, brought Armenia to uh, and Karabakh to uh, two disasters, one after the other, and. Uh, and uh, that was the consequence of his policies. Uh, having said that, I also believe that yes, he has to be re removed from uh, from the uh, power, and uh, that would be a, a good recipe for Armenia. But how to do that? I mean, uh, if if you do that through uh, his clinching to power, if you do that through uh, organizing state pro uh, street pro protest and to finally end up with uh, bringing Armenia into a chaos. Uh, by, if you, you are ending up by destabilizing Armenia, well, that would be the best invitation for Azeris to actually finish the job they started. Uh, and uh, so uh, while working on the removing Nikol Pashinyan from the power, you need to be very nuanced in that, so so that not to actually uh, uh, actually throw your country into the chaos and make things even worse. Uh, which means that uh, you know you, you need to, uh, to 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 build to engineer the removal of Nikol Pashinyan from the power on a more in more sophisticated way, say. Uh, having built uh, some very broad consolidation of the political forces around some important platform. Uh, and uh, so th that can make the removal of Nikol Pashinyan less, less uh, hurting to our country. I think maybe the lack of a clear leader from the opposition has been the, the key hampering issue. And you know, my, problem, my problem in all of this is that, you know, I think, if I could channel the uh, average uh, Armenian, is that we keep talking about consolidation over broad platforms. Those are not happening. I'm not seeing that happening. And we're losing more and more. Um, and it seems that, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, Levon, uh, we are probably months or weeks away from signing a, a um, so-called peace treaty that would <laughs> seed the, the so-called enclaves that Azerbaijan is claiming potentially give rights for uh, a corridor, even though it won't be called a corridor, uh, rights of return for Azerbaijanis with no right of return for Armenians uh, to Artsakh or Azerbaijan. Uh, so are, are those things that uh, are those things that we find acceptable to even risk um, at the expense of not rocking the boat in this time? You know, because yes, I understand things can always be um, Risky, but that has always been the argument. And every step of the way, we've got lost more and more. Well, I mean, if you are actually, if you want my opinion on the uh, peace process, peace negotiations with Azerbaijan, uh, let me do some explanation of my position on that. Uh, you know, Artakh, uh, which is now emptied and uh, you know, dehumanized, I would say, uh, was lost in two stages. The first stage was uh, uh, when, uh, in back in 2019, uh, Nikol Pashinyan was proposed uh, uh, this the so-called five plus two plan, and the idea was to give five regions beyond Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan. The so-called Lavrov plan. But it it is not. Uh, justifiably called Lavrov because the plan was actually uh, proposed by the three co-chairmen of the Minsk group. So, so it was officially signed by uh, by the United States, France, and uh, Russia. But uh, now it is known as Lavrov plan, as you 
uh, rightly said. Um, so what happened, uh, Nikol Pashinyan rejected the plan. Not only he rejected the plan, he rejected even the negotiations. He, he never engaged in the negotiations. And uh, what happened uh, was that he, he actually gave a lot of, uh, as I said, casus belli to uh, Azerbaijan, and he uh, he made you know mediators to look very bad at uh, Armenia, and uh, in the end uh, the war happened, and uh, we lost half of Karabakh. Uh, but the second stage was after the 9 November uh, agreement. And I want to elab elaborate on that because that explains uh, in what uh, kind of peace process we are now. Uh, initially, there was clear Russian-sponsored plan of, uh, I would call that, two communication roads plan, uh, which was coded in this 9 November statement. Uh, the idea was that Russia kind of provides and guarantees two links. One link, the Latin link between Armenia and Karabakh, and another link uh, for Azerbaijan between, uh, between Azerbaijan per se and, uh, and uh, Nakhichevan. And uh, the idea was that both, both uh, links, both uh, communication roads would be uh, secured by uh, the Russian presence, by the Russian military presence, so that uh, under Russian control, uh, two, the two nations of Armenia and Azerbaijan would get something from, the, from that uh, peace plan. Uh, and uh, Nikol Pashinyan initially embarked on in, in the on the, uh, the implementation of that uh, plan with big enthusiasm. You remember when he was elected, and the Russians actually helped him to be elected in 2021. He went to Moscow first, and uh, Putin said to him that, "Okay, you have now given a full popular uh, credit, so it's time for actually implementing difficult solutions." That never happened. At some point, uh, Nikol Pashinyan uh, decided that he can uh, avoid doing this and he can renege, renege on the uh, on the obligation to uh, number uh, number nine in the statement of nine November, which actually the obligation over the uh, giving uh, connection between Nakhichevan and Azerbaijan. Uh, Do you believe that was related to geopolitical uh, developments? Well, of course. Of course, because uh, I can tell you, uh, there was, uh, and uh, we learned that uh, recently, that uh, there was a gentleman agreement uh, between Russia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan on, uh, on the uh, status of Nagorno-Karabakh, that it will, the, the, the determination of that status would be left for the future uh, generations. And that was actually the key idea of the Russian plan. Because uh, on the one hand, it was in the Russian interest because that would uh, make uh, the presence of Russian peacekeepers very legitimate for indefinite time. Uh, in, in the, Because as long as there is disagreement between Armenians and Azeris on the status of Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, Russians, uh, Russian military presence as peacekeepers was legitimate and grounded. Uh, this uh, boded uh, well uh, also for Armenian interests because, uh, uh, you know, then we still have uh, this status unresolved and uh, uh, our Karabakh is there. Right. But the bitter pill. A bitter pill being restrictions, uh, restriction on the sovereignty in Sunik, allowing uh, for more Russian control on our territory. Uh, then what happened what was this uh, weird idea that uh, he, Pashinyan, can abandon, Nagorno, abandon Nagorno-Karabakh to Russia, effectively turning it from his own headache into Russia's one. Uh, 
it was effectively a deliberate sacrifice of Nagorno-Karabakh, aimed at appeasement of Azerbaijan and getting Russia out of region. And uh, he believed that with the help of the West, which was interested in actually pushing Russia, Russian peacekeepers out of, of the region, he, he believed that with the West, uh, Western support, he can reach on this uh, Russia negotiated uh, Megri communication route obligation. If he engages in the alternative Western format of negotiations with uh, Azerbaijan, and he thought that the West will put enough pressure on Azerbaijan if he uh, recognized uh, Artsakh as part of Azerbaijan. So what happened? Uh, he did that. The consequences were all there. Uh, and he expected that uh, now it is Aliyev's turn to come to the Western format in Granada and, uh, and actually sign the final peace agreement with, uh, with Armenia. That never happened. Because why didn't that happen? And why, uh, also, uh, the, why Aliyev also uh, actually re refused to go to uh, Brussels so, or Strasbourg for, for negotiations with uh, um, Charles Michel and Nicole Pashinyan? Because he got everything from the Western format that he wanted to, to get. And gave was, nothing. Uh, and gave nothing. Right. That was the, the, the end game of uh, Nicole Pashinyan's policy. So we got, but we, we gave Karabakh for free to Azerbaijan and got nothing. And the, the most amazing thing is that uh, you, you can even say, okay, now can we actually believe that the 9 November agreement is now void of any uh, of any force, so so it's not in force any anymore. No, you no. can't. No, you can't, because neither Russia nor Azerbaijan believe so. Would allow that, yeah. So that was actually a question we had a little bit later, whether yeah. Armenia, if there is any reason for Armenia to stay in the agreement, or basically it should take its signature back from that agreement. Why should we well, remain a signatory to the November 2020 agreement? Well, the problem is that if you withdraw from that agreement, uh, that effectively means you actually withdraw from ceasefire with Azerbaijan. Is it uh, a very reasonable thing to do right now? I don't know. It uh, effectively means. Uh, declaring the war saying that okay i'm not i'm going out of this ceasefire i mean i i am uh, i i i can agree the, the 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 9 november statement is completely screwed up mm -hmm. i mean the, the uh, they uh, the parties violated everything that they could violate but still effectively and formally that is the only ceasefire agreement in force, right. So uh, that uh, I, I don't, I, I, I don't believe that Armenia <clears throat> will be able to withdraw from this ceasefire agreement without actually having first uh, signed an alternative document, a peace agreement. I mean, the 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 hope of Pashinyan was that when he signs this agreement in Granada and then a peace agreement with. Uh, uh, Azerbaijan, that means he effectively withdraws from 9 November uh, ceasefire agreement. But that, Understood. Ne that never happened because Aliyev still wants something more. And he got everything he uh, wanted from the Western format, and now he is rejecting it. There is no Western format anymore for Aliyev. Yeah. And uh, there was a play between uh, Pashinyan and uh, Aliyev. Uh, Pashinyan was actually uh, rejecting any negotiations under the Russian format, and Aliyev is now uh, rejecting any negotiations under Western format. So there is a, you know, a very indefinite uh, yeah, and, you know, a very complicated situation now, which is fraught with a very 
dangerous developments for yeah. Armenia. Levon, you mentioned earlier that there was a gentleman's agreement during the November 2020 agreement that uh, about the status of Artsakh. Many unexplained things have happened since the agreement was signed. The surrender of Lachin and Karvaja regions, the unilateral handing over of the mind maps, for example, the surrender of Goris Kapan Highway, the complete non-reaction to the invasions of Armenia proper in May 2021, September 2021, September 2022, and on and on and on. There, there's no end to all those things. Were there unrecorded verbal agreements by Pashinyan made uh, that were not publicly disclosed? And I can be even a little more negative. Did did he sign, did, not sign, did he make agreements behind the back of the Armenian people? Well, uh, we don't know. Uh, Pashinyan rejects all assumptions that there, there, there were any. Uh, you may believe him or not, uh, but uh, interestingly enough, the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs actually revealed one of those uh, agreements, uh, which was this gentleman agreement on the postponing the decision on the Nagorno the status of Nagorno Karabakh. Now. Uh, if that is true, and it is true, because no nobody actually refuted it. Nobody, neither Armenia nor Azerbaijan. Nobody said that no, it was not true. I mean, uh, you are left only with the options to believe to what the Russians said in this uh, in this statement. So, if the, this is true, and I believe it is true, it uh, shows us that uh, you know, uh, in fact. Uh, Pashinyan deliberately missed this opportunity to actually preserve Nagorno Karabakh in the status quo that was that was created after the uh, the forty four uh, days day uh, uh, war. Okay. Now, what what else he what he agreed to? I don't know. I don't know. We we don't know. But uh, it is apparent that uh, he now wants to get rid of the uh, of all the agreements that uh, were reached under the uh, auspices of Russia. Uh, so, uh, where we what is what can we do further? I mean, uh, we will see. But uh, the problem is that uh, we are now in very vulnerable and unprotected position because because uh, the, the the russia the russia for russian format is rejected by armenia the uh, the, the western format is re rejected by azerbaijan and now sunik is under the fire and the, under the danger of azeri strike so given the current situation do you think we're on the brink of another war and how should we proceed from here? And also, uh, since you men uh, you mentioned that uh, on many cases, the Russians did not prevent Azeris from attacking our position, from taking some territories, I want to comment on that too. Yeah. Because, you know, if you analyze what happened, you, you would come uh, on the chronological uh, basis. You would come to a conclusion that actually all these transgressions of Azerbaijan they coincided with the uh, Russian, uh, I would not say defeats, but some uh, not successful operations in, yeah. in Ukraine. So apparently, uh, uh, the Nikol Pashinyan's uh, decision to recognize Artsakh as part of Azerbaijan was not the only cause of uh, of this uh, disaster in in Nagorno Karabakh another cause was the weakening of russia uh, it 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 is obvious that uh, russia badly miscalculated strategically because uh, it believed uh, the ukrainian war would be quick and successful it uh, it didn't go that way so uh, a lot of russian resources uh, have been you know 
sent to the Ukrainian front. Russia Russia has been weakened, and uh, and Azeris momentarily, immediately felt it, and uh, you know started their pressures on on Russia uh, because they understood that Russia cannot afford having another conflict, another front uh, in the Caucasus. Ru uh, that Russia cannot go into uh, uh, deep confrontation with Azerbaijan and eventually with Turkey. That would be disastrous for Russia. So, um, so yes, uh, we and we, we have to say that Russia actually uh, reneged on its obligations. It uh, it didn't protect Armenians in many situations. Uh, but uh, I would say that both Nikol Pashinyan's decision and the Russia weak and Russia's weakening uh, were the most important causes of this uh, Kar Karabakh disaster. Okay. And now, since we're talking about Russia, that's a good segue. Um, you know, ever since Pashinyan came to power, there has been speculation about his policy uh, on the geopolitical vector of Armenia. Um, you know, some still say, uh, you know, few, uh, few in number, but some still say that he is actually doing everything that Russia wants. But, uh, you know, I think as time went on, we saw more and more that he was, um, you know, deliberately angering Russia, doing everything possible to uh, alienate Russia. I think that was something that uh, Benjamin Bogosan said a few episodes ago on our show. And after the war, basically, he um, uh, started criticizing specifically Russia for failing to uh, protect Artsakh. Uh, he criticized our, uh, Russia for failing to protect Armenia. Uh, then, you know, just a, a few weeks ago, before he went to Strasbourg, he said, you know, Armenia is not going anywhere from Russia. We are not going to, uh, you know, kick out the Russian base. The next day, he went to Strasbourg and said that Russia, again, uh, abandoned us. Um, and then he, I think just a few days ago, I think in the Wall Street Journal, he had an interview where he said that he doesn't see an advantage for the Russian bases to remain in Armenia. So what is going on? What is uh, Pashinyan's ultimate policy with regard to Armenia's uh, external geopolitical orientation, in your opinion? You know, I don't see any rational strategic calculation in what uh, Nikol Pashinyan is doing. Uh, in these difficult times, we know uh, the world is uh, now in a very unprecedented, uh, you know, developments that uh, uh, we, know, we know that there is a competition for a new competition for hegemony in the world between uh, the West led by the United States and we, we, could, we can say East or we can say South led by, uh, by China and Russia. And uh, in this competition of camps, which is becoming, uh, you know, tenser and tenser on a daily basis, it was very important to, uh, to position uh, our country really effectively, because uh, both camps would uh, demand that you go to their side and uh, side with them uh, against the, uh, the other camp. But that was that would be the the worst solution for Armenia. Uh, you know, uh, for a small, unprotected country like Armenia, vulnerable country, uh, siding or becoming a satellite of uh, in one of the camps would immediately bring uh, an uh, ire of uh, of the other camp. With all possible pressures and sanctions and uh, even military interventions, so uh, the best solution for Armenia would be to try to be cooperative with both camps. Somebody would ask, uh, "Is it possible?" Well, yes, it is possible. The answer uh, is given by many countries, like Georgia, like Azerbaijan, like. Uh, uh, republics of Central Asia, 
those countries are trying to be in very good on good terms with both the West and uh, Russia, and they succeed in that. Uh, you know, we need Russia uh, not only because uh, they have strong military presence in in the Caucasus, and they have uh, you know uh, very strong ambitions to stay in the Caucasus and to be uh, a very important actor in the Caucasus. We, we also need Russia because of uh, many uh, economic factors. We our our economy is completely, uh, you know, contingent on uh, deliveries of Russian gas, on you know, or, or exports, exports and imports, and yeah. any any uh, destruction uh, in that uh, direction would put uh, Armenia's economy, you know, in in chaos, in decay. Levon. So what do you make of all the incomprehensible messaging? Is it part of a deliberate effort to confuse the audience, or is it not having a plan on the part of Pashinyan? Uh, well, uh, for to answer to, to your question, I, I have to continue on, the, uh, on my analysis on the side of West, because... Uh, we are we are also dependent on the West. We need the West. We need uh, the, the help of their financial institutions such as World Bank and uh, IMF, and uh, and also we understand that Russia is has been weakened and Russia uh, Russia uh, did not deliver on its obligations and there is a, some security vacuum around Armenia and we need to find out. Or to seek for alternative protections, and so our uh, ties with the West are indispensable. But that doesn't mean uh, you can you have to build your relations with the West at the cost of you know absolutely ruining your relations with Russia, because what is now going between Russia and Armenia is uh, disastrous. I mean, they, yeah. this is a disaster. They they behave like enemies and uh, and uh, if you are so dependent uh, for the security for the economy on such a big country as russia being uh, an enemy for russia uh, is not the best solution it's actually the recipe for a disaster and uh, you know the problem is that uh, pashinyan is helped is being helped by some political forces in armenia who actually, uh, you know, push Armenia in that direction, in the in the direction of, you know, becoming enemy of Russia. Uh, mm-hmm. One of those strange statements was one of those politicians even told that, you know, uh, now we are in better position. We were a v- victim of Russia, but now our status is uh, higher. We we have become the enemy of Russia. So these guys are happy uh, with uh, this. Uh, a very weird understanding of what constitutes actually uh, making your status higher. So if you are not a victim but you are an enemy, it's a, it's a it's a promotion. That's mm. that's what they think. And I I'm sorry to think that actually this is also Nikol Pashinyan's mindset. Uh, this is very very dangerous. Uh, it is uh, criminally adventurous, and uh, uh, I, I really, uh, I'm really frightened by the prospects of what can happen if these policies are continued. When we were talking earlier about ANC policies, you mentioned wishful thinking versus realistic policies. How That's realistic true. is the idea that the West can replace Russia as a strategic ally of Armenia? That's a very important question, and uh, uh, I, what I uh, would say would probably be very disappointing for those who actually believe in uh, this alternative. But those guys uh, have to understand that uh, you know uh, there is uh, strong geopolitical data that actually indicates the, that that is not the possibility. Why? I'll I'll tell you. Uh, of course, we see that uh, the West is condemning Azerbaijan for its actions, and it it uh, 
uh, has issued multiple statements uh, degrading Azerbaijan, criticizing Azerbaijan, and demanding some actions from Azerbaijan. But they never made any decisions on actually pressuring on Azerbaijan through sanctions or military intervention or something else. Why? It's very easy to explain. One thing is that uh, Azerbaijan is actually uh, one of, has become now one of the most important energetic partners of the European Union. And uh, Azerbaijan delivers now 5% of carbon energetics for, for Europe, which is huge. And uh, European, the European Union is very much dependent on Azerbaijan for, for this reason. But there is one more important reason that actually makes uh, uh, makes intervention from the West on behalf of and in protection of Armenia impossible, which is uh, the factor of Israel. The problem is that, uh, uh, and I want to state that very clearly, uh, Israel was one of the architects of uh, the military victory of Azerbaijan over Armenia. Israel, Israel, Israelis uh, send a lot of uh, weaponry and uh, equipment to Israel. Uh, uh, sorry, to, to Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan. Yeah, to Azerbaijan. And uh, in the in the decade preceding, actually, to the uh, war uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, the seventy percent of weapon deliveries of military deliveries were from Israel. But more than that, you know how important uh, the Iron Dome equipment is uh, for Israel. They, they have actually only 10 Iron Domes, and it's a very sophisticated and very expensive uh, anti-missile anti uh, installation. Uh, and uh, they they actually never would uh, give that that uh, iron dome to anybody. Ukraine requested for that. Uh, South Korea requested. They they have never given them anything. Uh, I mean, they have never give give them gave uh, given them this uh, iron dome. But they gave it to Azerbaijan. So from eleven installations of iron dome, one is. One is given to Azerbaijan, and that actually uh, gave Azerbaijan the possibility to uh, interject, intercept the missiles from Armenia directed at uh, Mingechau, which would be uh, an important, uh, an important hit to Azerbaijan. And uh, and let me tell you one thing: Azerbaijan would never started that would have never started that war if uh, Mingechaur uh, would not be protected by Iron Dome. And is Israel gave them that Iron Dome. Uh, they gave they they gave them for free Lora missiles, which are very important and effective missiles that Azerbaijan used in the war against Armenia. And they they gave also. Uh, drones of different classifications, and, and most importantly, uh, the drones that uh, actually uh, are uh, not uh, hitting drones, but the drones that uh, uh, observe the reconnaissance reconnaissance drones. And uh, yeah. uh, the, this was very important, and they gave to Azerbaijan also very important and accurate digital maps of Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia. So uh, I'm telling this, Israel is uh, the most important architect of the victory of uh, Azerbaijan uh, against Armenia. But now the question arises, why is Israel helping Azerbaijan so much? Uh, are they so anti-Armenian? Uh, do, do they want to destroy Armenians or what? And my answer would be, no, the, they have completely different motivation. Uh, I would not think that Israeli has some super objective to destroy Armenia. No. What they want is to uh, have a very strong and militarily potent Azerbaijan as a possible weapon in the future war against Iran. 
And the most important uh, element of this program is that uh, both Israel and uh, the United States and uh, many Western security agencies uh, they they uh, would they have been thinking about you know turning the Azeri separatism you know that there is there are right. uh, there are a lot of Azeris uh, Azer ethnic Azeris in Iran according to different. Uh, assessments uh, starting from 10 to 25 percent of uh, population. Uh, well, some figures can be exaggerated, but uh, in the end, we understand that this is a huge population. And yeah, it's estimated that 10 to 15 million Azeri ethnic Azeris in the north of Iran. Yes, and if the West uh, is successful in rising uh, Azeri nationalism and separatism within Iran. That would be a uh, enormous uh, and uh, big weapon against Iran. So uh, that's why uh, Israel is helping Azerbaijan. Uh, they want Azerbaijan to get rid of Armenian problems, so that uh, the becomes a weapon against Iran. And now, when we have this escalation of the conflict between Israel and Hamas, and we very clearly see that two camps are quickly forming around one on, or the other side, it is uh, increasingly understandable that uh, if uh, this confrontation becomes a confrontation of geopolitical count, confrontation between th those big camps, the West would be on the side of Azerbaijan, not Armenia. Because it's it, from the geopolitical reasons, it... Uh, it matters much more for for the West uh, in this whole in this whole confrontation. So that's why I believe, and uh, I think I, I try to prove that uh, you know believing that uh, the West would decisively intervene in for the protection of Armenia from Azerbaijan is a fairy tale. So you're talking about Israel. Of course, Israel has its own problems right now uh, because earlier Hamas instigated a fresh round of violence in Israel. You know, thousands have died in that conflict. And as you noted, um, this has repercussions all the way to South Caucasus and Armenia. So how should Armenia nav navigate this issue? Clearly, Iran is very pro-Palestinian. Is um, Azerbaijan is pro-Israel, and Turkey, of course, is straddling and playing all fronts. So how should Armenia navigate it? You know, uh, we should not side with anybody. We, we have to remain neutral, not only in this particular confrontation, but also in the bigger confrontation between the West and Russia. Because uh, one thing, if you remain a possible hub for a co cooperation, even for those uh, camps being in the confrontation, which actually we we have been enjoying for uh, recent months. I mean, we have become a, uh, a hub of cooperation between the West and Russia, because a lot of things, uh, finances, goods, were going through Armenia between the West and, uh, and Russia. And from a diplomatic uh, perspective, even the OSCE Minsk Group itself was a collaboration. That's true. Uh, but I am speaking now about these tense uh, confrontation times. And we've mm -hmm. been, uh, Yerevan Airport became a breach because, because from the West, they, they cannot go to, the, to Russia. They come to Yerevan and they go to Russia. And the Russians come to Yerevan and they go and then go to West. So we have become a, a bridge, uh, a hub. Of cooperation, and that actually be, be, uh, brought a lot of benefits for our economy. Uh, the, the, this uh, GDP rise was mostly due to these uh, opportunities that we, uh, you know, unexpectedly received uh, by holding this neutral position between the, the two camps. But now, what Pashinyan's does. Uh, is turning Armenia into from the hub, from the bridge between these two, two, two camps into a polygon 
of a proxy war between the West and Russia. That is uh, absolutely incredibly dangerous for Armenia. We don't want to become an arena, a stage, a scene of, uh, of uh, you know, proxy war. A battle, yeah, a battleground. Yes, we don't want to do that. But Nikol Pashinyan's, exact, Nikol Pashinyan's policies are exactly aimed at that. I don't know whether he uh, consciously understands the consequences of uh, that policies. Uh, if, if he doesn't understand that, uh, that's even worse, because then, then we will, then we will uh, be destined to you know, go through a big ca- catastrophe. Uh, uh, so when I, I'm trying to understand why is he doing this, why is he ruining, uh, you know, our economic uh, cooperation with Russia? Why, why is he doing all these things? Um, I can only uh, come up with the idea that uh, he's probably th- thinking that, you know, uh, at some point, if everything turns very ugly, he can just uh, run to the West and uh, and uh, for the rest of his life, he would be, you know... Uh, Asylum somewhere. ...entering the students in uh, the Western universities by saying, uh, by teaching them how he was trying to uh, build democracy in Armenia and to get Armenia rid of, uh, of uh, Russia evil. And uh, in the end, he actually failed to do that, but he would uh, still uh, be a proponent of uh, of uh, of that approach and enjoy all the uh, all the uh, comfort that uh, he can uh, take from that that kind of position. I, um, I don't know. I don't understand any rationale behind what he is doing. Yeah, you talked a little bit about the Ukraine war uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, yeah. This is the greater and the longer term issues in the global geopolitical rearrangements that are going on right now. Um, what is your outlook for that war? What scenarios arise if, let's say, Russia wins? In fact, maybe the question should be, can Russia lose? Because it's such an existential war for itself. Well, let me tell you one thing. Uh... Stephen Walt uh, had a very good of uh, uh, article published. Uh, I don't remember in which journal, but uh, that's you know he's a very well-known political scientist. And uh, what he was saying, uh, I I really enjoyed that because he said, you know, there 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 are so many analysts from, analysts from both sides saying that Russia will definitely win or or the west would definitely win and they were they all turned to be wrong because nobody can predict that right nobody can predict that and uh, the reason for that is because the this war has turned into a nutrition war meaning the competition between the resources of big russia and uh, on the one hand, and and Chinese are also helping one or the other way to 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 the Russians and the West. Those are big camps with huge resources, and they are competing now by throwing more and more resources into 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 this war. And nobody knows uh, who will be winning in the end. Right now, it looks that Russia has some strategic adva- advantage over over uh, Ukraine and over the West because uh, the Ukraine fatigue is rising in uh, in, in the West. Yeah, we right. can we can see that uh, both uh, in Europe where uh, new countries emerge that uh, are against the uh, help against the military help to Ukraine, like Slovakia, for example, in addition to Hungary. And we can see that Ukraine fatigue in the uh, Republican, uh, camp of uh, of the of uh, America, uh, GOP is uh, uh, every, uh, can, can, I mean obviously uh, obviously turning this issue even 
into one of the important uh, issues of the future pres- presidential campaign. Right. And, uh, and uh, uh, very easily Ukraine can uh, find it in a very difficult position if uh, the support of the United States would uh, gradually diminish. So, uh, as I said, right now it looks like Russia has strategic advances, but there there are some invisible, uh, you know, uh, aspects in each uh, on the each side that uh, at some point can become, uh, you know, very important. Such as, for instance, was the Prigozhin's uh, upheaval uh, in Russia. Uh, you don't know what can happen, uh, and. Uh, and uh, the the safest uh, assumption would be uh, that we don't know who who is winning. So the same question about about this, as I asked about the Israeli conflict, how should Armenia navigate this? So uh, so uh, very important question. Um, look, when we don't know who is winning and who will who will end up with winning this war it is even more dangerous to side with uh, with uh, to clearly side with one camp first of all it may turn out that an, uh, the other camp would actually win the war and then you would be uh, i would say the bet your bet would fail and uh, in politics making bets is a very bad idea I mean, are you betting the fortunes and uh, the the destiny of our nation? That is uh, the worst idea you can imagine. Uh, On the other side, even if you have bet it on the right side, as it would turn out in the future, that is still dangerous. Because Right now, the other side still has some resources to, uh, you know, to and will be able to damage you and to hurt you. So even if in the case the, that uh, supposedly your bet would, uh, you know, uh, be a right one in the future, that is still a bad policy to bet uh, to to bet on on one side. So, but that is exactly what uh, Pashinyan is doing. And this is very dangerous. Betting the destiny of your nation is a very bad, adventurous, uh, very dangerous idea. All right. Um, We'll leave it there for today. Thank you, Mr. Zurabian, for your time. Thank Thank you, you, Levon. We hope you come back often. I do, too. Uh, Well, uh, that was a pleasure, and I'm ready. I'm ready whenever you invite me for such a conversation to participate in that. Thank Thank you you. very much. All right, that's our show. We hope you found it useful. Please find us on social media and follow us everywhere you get your Armenian news. The links are in the show notes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.